And a happy good day to you. Hope you're all feeling well. The sutta tonight or today is 109, the greater discourse on the full moon night. Now, this sutta, it has an awful lot of repetition in it, and it has some things in it that aren't supposed to be here. In the sutta itself, it tells you about the um, kasina meditation. Do you want to put the lights on too? Yeah, I think that's better. At least I can see better. And it has the earth kasina and water kasina and a lot of other psychic developments. But that's from the, the Brahmin point of view. That's from a one-pointed point of view. So I'm taking that out of the, the discourse. And also, there's an awful lot of repeating the same thing over and over again. And I'm going to take the repetition out. So if you're following me, it might be somewhat difficult at first. So you get the gist of what I'm doing. So, thus have I heard on one occasion, a blessed one was living at Sawati in the eastern park, in the palace of Megara's mother. Megara's mother is actually Megara's uh, sister, or not sister, uh, daughter. And she did some things and helped him in the Dhamma. And so he started saying that she is his mother. So that's what that's talking about. If you want to know about that, go to the Jataka Tale uh, commentary. And there's great stories in there. It's real fun reading all of those stories because the guy that wrote it was... Uh, just a regular author, but he had a great sense of humor. So it's real fun to, to read this stuff. On that occasion, on the Upasada day of the 15th, the first and the 15th is days where everybody would take their eight precepts and spend the day either at a temple and they would be listening to Dhamma talks and reading suttas and things like that. So every 1st and 15th, they did this sort of thing. And that's, that's when everybody wore white clothes too. Okay, on the full moon night, the Blessed One was seated in, seated in the open, surrounded by the Sangha of monks. Then a certain monk rose from his seat, arranged his upper robe on one shoulder, and extended his hands in reverential salutation towards the Blessed One, and said to him, Venerable Sir, I would ask the Blessed One about a certain point, if the Blessed One would grant me an answer to my question. Sit on your seat, monk. Now, this is an important little thing that most people think that you got to sit on the floor to do the meditation. And I used to tell people they didn't have chairs and such. They did. 
they sat on seats. They sat on seats when they were doing their meditation. Sitting on the floor is no magic and it causes an awful lot of pain. Now in India, you go to somebody's house, they always sit on the floor. But after about 15 or 20 minutes, they're all squirming because they have a lot of pain coming up. And it takes a long time to be able to get used to sitting on the floor without moving. That was because the Brahmins that were doing meditation for long periods of time, they'd go into the forest, they'd just find a place to sit down. And then they would be sitting on the ground and they'd do their meditation. So that's where this tradition came from. That's not truly the tradition of doing your practice when you're uh, doing the meditation. And that makes me real excited to, to think that this is a good thing to sit in a chair and sit comfortably so you don't have a tendency to move. Okay, sit on your own seat, monk, and ask what you like. So the monk sat on his own seat and said to the Blessed One, Are there not, Venerable Sir, the five aggregates affected by craving and clinging, that is, material form aggregate, the feeling aggregate, the perception aggregate, the formation aggregate, and the consciousness aggregate. Now, I'm going to break here for just a moment. Those who are more advanced in their meditation, they've come to me for years saying, this is like Nibbana. And it is very much like Nibbana, but it's mundane Nibbana. You can walk around, you can be doing your job, you can be doing anything. And the aggregates don't arise. It comes from a pure mind. So when the aggregates don't arise, there's nothing that disturbs your mind. So this is a real good thing. And as you go deeper and deeper in your meditation, you'll see for yourself, yeah, I like this. My mind's exceptionally clear. Everything is bright. Everything is real amazing. And this is a form of Nibbana because there's no craving that arises. There's no hindrances that arise. Your mind is just super clear and that's why it is still mundane okay these monks are the five aggregates affected by clinging and it goes through the whole thing again saying good venerable sir the monk delighted and rejoiced in the blessed one's words then he asked him a further question but venerable sir, in what of these five aggregates affected by clinging are rooted? These five aggregates affected by clinging are rooted in desire, in desire, monk. I would never say that. It's rooted in craving. That's the cause of the false belief in a personal self. That's the cause of all hindrances arising. Venerable Sir, is that, the, is that clinging the same as the five aggregates affected by clinging? Or is that clinging something apart from the five aggregates affected by clinging? Monk, that clinging is neither the same, nor is it apart from the five aggregates affected by clinging. 
It is the craving and lust in regard to those five aggregates. But, venerable sir, can there be diversity in that craving and lust regarding the five aggregates? There can be, monk, the Blessed One said, here, someone thinks, may my material form be thus in the future, or feeling, or perception, or formations, or consciousness. Thus, there is diversity in that craving and lust regarding the five aggregates. But, venerable sir, in what way does the term aggregate apply to the aggregates? Any kind of material form, whatever, whether past, future, or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, this is the material aggregate and any kind of feeling, any kind of perception, any, any kind of formation, any kind of consciousness. In this way, monks, that term aggregate applies to the aggregates. That makes sense. You can also give the definition of aggregate as things held together. And what are things held together with? Craving. When you attain arahatship, there's nothing holding these aggregates together anymore. And they dissipate. And this is in agreement with science these days, because they say that there's a kind of consciousness in space, in the vacuum of space. There's still a kind of consciousness. And they're finding out, too, that not only is their consciousness, beings can have these aggregates come together and form little tiny animals or bacteria or whatever you want to call it. They're little tiny beings. So when people are trying to say that everything is alive, and it's true, it's all held together with craving, and the kind of animal that is reborn occurs because of karmic action that they did in the past. That's how you know you're reborn here or there, whatever. I know this is getting kind of deep, but it is real interesting to start to see how everything is connected on the physical plane. So by your doing your meditation and your letting go of craving, you are, in, uh, you are affecting the entire universe with your positive actions. Kind of fun thinking like that, isn't it? You affect the world, not the world, the universe around you in a positive way when you're positive, when you're laughing, when you're having fun. So why do I try to get you to smile all the time? Huh? Because I know the effect that it has on you and every material thing around you. I know some people that they, they take joy in cursing. They take joy in uh, breaking precepts in one way or another. And they're pulling the whole universe down by doing that. 
and you're counteracting their bad actions. When enough people get together that are super positive, that can walk around with aggregates that don't arise, then you're affecting your universe in such a positive way that everything in that universe will start to change again. And this is according to the physics of, the, of our time that always changes because of new ideas and such. But it's pretty amazing when you start thinking like this. So you affect the world around you, you affect the universe around you every time you have a happy thought, every time you're grateful for something, every time you wish somebody else happiness. Fun. To me, that's fun anyway. What is the cause and condition, venerable sir, for the manifestation of material form aggregate? And for feeling, and for perception, and formations, and consciousness. The four great elements are the cause and condition for the manifestation of all of the aggregates. Now, if you're following what I'm, what I'm reading right now, you're seeing how much I'm really cutting out because it goes through each of the individual consciousnesses and you don't really need that. Oops. There. Venerable sir, how does personality view come to be? That's an interesting question and a question I get asked a lot. Okay. But it, it happens because of the aggregate, aggregates and the craving, it's mainly the craving. But venerable sir, how does a personality view not come to be? Here, a well-taught noble disciple who has regard for noble ones is skilled and disciplined in their dhamma. That is you, all of you. You're well-taught. So that makes you part of the Buddhist Sangha. But you don't have to go through any ceremony to do it. You have to just start being more, more and more aware of where, where you are and what you're doing. <clears throat> okay. Regarding the true men and the noble disciples, one does not regard material form as self. Everything is impersonal. And you see the impersonality nature very, very clearly when you do your meditation. I have some people that are kind of confused and they'll say, well, but I have a self in a non-self kind of way. What does that mean? It's really confusing. But when you use your intuition and ask these kind of questions, your intuition will come and tell you what it means. Venerable sir, what is the gratification? What is the danger? What is the escape in the case of all of these aggregates? 
pleasure and joy that arise in dependence on one of these aggregates. Hmm. So pleasure and joy. Changing the universe. That's where you become grateful. That's what true gratification is talking about. It's talking about this uplifted mind that's happy, that's grateful for all of the wonderful things around you. You see how this is all getting inter interconnected in sutta. Sutta means cloth. And all of these different little things are put together to make this truly magnificent cloth of Dhamma, of changing the universe, of being more and more happy as time goes by. Okay. Well, this sutta is short when you take out all of the repetition. It was like 14 pages, now it's two. <laughs> oh, venerable sir, how does one know? How does one see? So in regard to this body with its consciousness and all external signs, there is no eye-making, mind-making, underlying tendency to conceit. Any kind of aggregate whatever, whether past or present, internal or external, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, one sees all of these aggregates as they actually are with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. Then, in mind of a certain monk, this thought arose. So it seems... All material form is not self. All feeling is not self. All perception is not self. All, forma all formations are not self. Excuse me, I just belch. All consciousness is not self. What self then will actions done by that non-self affect? Confused question. Then the Blessed One, knowing in his mind the thought in the mind of that monk, addressed the monk thus, it is possible that some misguided men here, obtuse and ignorant, with his mind dominated by craving, might think that he can outstrip the teacher's dispensation thus. So it seems material form is not self, and all the other aggregates are not self. What self, then, will actions done by that non-self affect? Now, monks, you have been trained by me through interrogation on various occasions in regard to these various things. What do you think? Is material form permanent or impermanent? Impermanent, venerable sir, is what is impermanent suffering or happiness? Happiness, or suffering, venerable sir, excuse me is what is impermanent, suffering, and subject to change, fit to be regarded, this is mine, this I am, this is myself? No, venerable sir. Monk, what do you think? Is feeling, perception, formations, or consciousness permanent or impermanent? 
impermanent venerable sir is what is impermanent suffering or happiness suffering venerable sir is what is impermanent suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus this is mine this i am this is myself no venerable sir therefore monks any kind of aggregate whatever whether past future or present all aggregates should be seen as they actually are with proper wisdom thus this is not mine this i am not this is not myself seeing thus a well-taught noble disciple becomes disenchanted with material form now everyone that has experienced jhana the reason that it is such a major step even if you only experience jhana one time in your life you don't get caught up in your emotional identifications with the hindrances you see them for what they actually are they're only hindrances yeah they they disturb your meditation yeah but you're not taking it personally in other words you you don't have to worry about being bipolar you don't have to worry about being a schizophrenic because it's not going to happen see how powerful this is and there are so many advantages in your life to be able to be around people that are upset in one way or another emotionally and to be able to radiate loving kindness to them or equanimity to them so that their mind becomes balanced and when you do that you are affecting the entire universe i used to think a lot about the word universe and i always gave it the definition of one song and that's how we're all interconnected but that's not it the universe is the coming together of the aggregates think about that one for a while that, that's nice and deep so in a in a way it is one song because it's all the same in the anguttara nikaya it talks about what it's like to die when you become an arahant well what is it like it's like a sand castle on the beach made up of all of these tiny little grains of sand and the ocean comes and washes it down flat can you put that exact same uh, sand castle back together again no and that's what happens with arahants when they die it's not that consciousness is it disappears it's still there or feeling or perception or formations or consciousness they're still there but they're not held together by craving any longer so i'm giving you a pretty deep a sutta today something to think about a lot 
But I think it should make all of you very happy to hear what I'm saying, because why are we here? We're here for two reasons. One, we're here to learn. To learn what? That everything is impersonal. Everything in the universe is impersonal. And you affect the, the personal or the impersonal nature of everything by being happy, by having an uplifted mind, by not taking things impersonally. It's a hard concept to grasp. I'll give you that. But it is the truth. And to be quite honest, as I'm saying this right now, I'm reconfirming, yeah, that is true. I'd never thought of it in this way. But this is the way the Buddha was teaching us. This is why it's not a religion. It doesn't have anything to do with religion. It has to do with how things in the universe actually work. From the smallest virus to the biggest animal, to the biggest planet, to the biggest sun, they all work in exactly the same way and you affect all of them by being happy. by having uplifting thoughts, by having this passion arise if you happen to break a precept, how much guilt do you feel because of that? Oh my, it's really a lot. And you think about it over and over again, you have it occurring so much of the time. But when you change your perspective and you start to see the impersonal nature of everything and you see how having a happy, uplifted mind, how powerful it actually is. You want to affect Pluto today? Smile and send that smiling thought to Pluto. You want to have more planets that have life form on them? Then smile and wish that to happen. That's how powerful you really are. It's not a maybe. This is the way it works. And the more people that get together with happy, uplifted mind, the more powerful it becomes. You want to change the way the government works right now? Because it's really not very nice. Get together with your friends and wish them loving and kind thoughts to radiate every cell in their body. Wish them happiness and see how fast the government changes. Now, this is kind of in agreement with what the Bible says. The Bible talks about a thousand years of, of health and prosperity and all kinds of wonderful things. I think that's uh, the time limit is too short on that sort of thing but it can be the entire universe. That's why we're here. We're here to learn and we're here to spread this positive feeling throughout the universe. You know, a lot of people, they, they talk about, oh, the universe is so big and no, it's not. 
it's only as big as you think it is. So, what do you want to do? Do you want to go around and suffer? Curse all the gods for causing the suffering? Or not? It's your choice. I'm not here to dictate anything to anybody. My job is just to inform. I am a teacher. That's all. You want to believe what I have to say? Fine. If you don't, fine. I don't care. I really don't. I can be happy whether you like me or not. I can be happy if you want to cause me physical pain. So what's physical pain? It's just stuff coming up. It's nothing. You're all going to have a good reaper if you follow these directions. It's that simple. And watch your universe change around you as you do that. Laugh. Have fun. Okay? Now, this is really an important sutta. It is very deep. I got to grant you that. As I said, it was 15 pages, but I took all the repetition out and made it into two or three. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a lot faster than I thought was going to happen. Okay, being disenchanted, you become dispassionate. That means giving up all of the hindrances. Through dispassion, his mind is liberated. No more attachments, no more aggregates, no more anything. When it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it is liberated. Now, some people say, well, if you're an arahat, that means you just stop existing. No, that's not true. You walk around without having any aggregates disturbing you. So you walk around with a clear mind and anybody asks you a question, you'll be able to answer it not because you're so super smart, but because you understand how this process actually works. The all things, including dependent origination, are part of the mundane suffering processes. But understanding how these things arise and you stop taking you stop taking them personally and you change the universe around you, then you can explain that to other people. I was just telling one of my students, this is an incredibly, Im incredibly important time to be born. I mean, we're so close to the Buddha's teaching, and now the Buddha's teaching is starting to really show us the way to overcome suffering and overcome that false belief in a personal self. If you experience one jhana one time in your life, that is not one-pointed concentration, because that has the I am that attached to it. You've all been lucky enough to come around to a teaching that is absolutely perfect. It's absolutely pure. There's no dying. What, what dies? 
if everything is impersonal, there's, there is no dying. There's just a rising, passing away of stuff. That's all. And what relief is there in that? It's truly remarkable. He understands birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. I love that statement, the holy life has been lived, because you're living the holy life. You're all saints. But not the definition that other religions give to the idea of being a saint. You're all saints because you affect the universe around you that you live in. So anybody tries to trick you with any kind of weird question, you know what the truth is. You can give them the proper answer. Whether they accept it or not, not yours to worry about. All you're doing is giving out information. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Now that's going to happen to all of us when we die. Eventually. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Now, while this discourse was being spoken through not craving and clinging or taking things personally, the minds of many, many monks were liberated from the taints. See, that's how powerful this sutta is. It's number 77. I, I encourage everybody to go. Oh, excuse me. I was thinking of another sutta. 109. Thank you, David. It's really an amazing sutta, especially when you start realizing the impersonal nature of everything and how the process of life continues on. And you are no different than the smallest, tiniest little animal. You still have your aggregates. They might not be so apparent, but it doesn't matter. And I, I struggled with the idea of no death. Because it just seemed like they, I see a lot of people that are born and then they die. I see a lot of that. And I'm thinking, how can how, can there be no death? Well, if there's no life, there is no death. Right? Think about that for a minute and you'll, you'll see what I'm saying. There's only a coming together of these aggregates that are affected by craving and clinging in every being around. So it's quite an amazing insight. You're going to disappear from this realm, go to another realm. Okay. One of the things that happens, especially with the Christians, they, they want to know when, what made this world come to be. Well, our belief system. And they have, they have to believe something. And there is a real problem with that because it doesn't agree with the way things actually work. Here. 
So I've been talking for a short time this time. <laughs> uh, I really like seeing your faces light up the way they have been. Because this kind of understanding is truly unusual. It's absolutely fantastic. It's amazing. Oh, we have a question in the chat. Okay, we have a question in the chat. So what is that? Uh, do Buddha, do the, does the Buddha and the Arahant still positively affect the universe even though their aggregates are not held together? Yes, of course. If yes, in what way? Always, just like you do. The question was, do the Buddha and all of the Arahats still affect the universe? And the answer is yes, absolutely, just like you do. It does, you don't have to have a body or a consciousness that's attached to anything to be happy. Right? So the more you spend time on being happy and smiling, the more you affect the universe positively, and maybe we'll stop worrying about asteroids getting too close to the, to the planet. So I'm sorry that this is such a short thing, but I think it's very important. So we'll see what happens between now and next week, see how it goes. Let's affect something little like the government. Just start being happy with every time you turn on the television, radiate loving kindness to them without any resistance, just radiate loving kindness, okay? We'll see if we can change things around. Okay, so <clears throat> I share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and navas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Have a good week and keep smiling. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante.